We're thrilled to bring you this conversation with science journalist Rachel Gross here with Vagina Obscura, An Anatomical Voyage. The book presents new findings that cast light on the most intimate aspects of female existence and experience. You may ask, why is the Writers' Institute hosting a public event about something so private? Truly, is this any of our business? We have some answers. More than anything, the book is a story well told. Rachel Gross takes us along on an exciting journey to parts unknown. Less known, in her words, as the bottom of the sea or the surface of Mars. Secondly, this book is not only an adventure in science, it's also an adventure in language. Language rooted in shame and secrecy and misconceptions. Language that stunted the growth of scientific study and harmed the lives of women for generations. Thirdly, this book gives voice to women scientists. An important mission of the Writers' Institute is to help marginalized communities find their voices. Women scientists are indeed a community that needs a bigger megaphone. Finally, we're proud of the fact that we've brought and will continue to bring many of the finest science writers in the world to this university to answer your questions, to inspire your writing, and to expand your universe. Science writing is an urgent matter. Not only does it equip us to meet the challenges we face as a species, but it also introduces us to the wonders and astonishments that make life worth living. This book will win some awards. It will receive wide attention. You're pri privileged to get a glimpse of it before you see Rachel on the morning talk shows or hear her on All Things Considered in Fresh Air. Again, the official publication date is uh, the 29th of March. Please give an explosive welcome <laughs> to Rachel Gross. You can use the podium if oh, you want to read. Podium. Yeah. I have the stage. Okay. Thank you all for being here tonight on a cold night, apparently the day before spring break. I'm honored to be here. Um, thank you for that introduction. I don't know that I'll be on the morning shows, but, uh, but I am here. Um, so I'm just going to read um, from the introduction of the book. It's the only part of the book that I'm in, so don't worry. If you buy this book, you will not have to deal with much of me. Only about ten pages. Uh, oh, here it is. Named, claimed, and shamed. There comes a time in every woman's life when her body bumps up against the limits of human knowledge. In that moment, she sees herself as medicine has seen her. A mystery, an enigma, a black box that, for some reason, no one has managed to get inside. The women I talked to for this book were all made to feel that they alone had a complicated, unruly body. They began to suspect, or were outright told, that somehow it was their fault, that they should be ashamed, should lie down and think about what they've done. My own moment came in July 2018. I was 29 years old, and I had an itch I couldn't scratch. For the past month, my vulva had felt on the verge of bursting into flames. At first, my gynecologist, a tiny, no-nonsense woman named Dr. Pico, thought I had an exuberant yeast infection. But one antifungal treatment and two rounds of antibiotics later, she had some bad news. My tormentor was a bacterial infection that I'd never heard of. For half of women who get it, it pops up again and again without warning, like a whack-a-mole. There was one last treatment I could try. It's basically rat poison, she told me. You're going to see that on the internet, so I might as well tell you now. It was called boric acid, and thanks to its fungi and bacteria killing powers, it's been used since the 1800s in antibacterial ointments, douching washes, and roach and ant killers. The idea was to nuke the ecosystem inside my vagina, wiping out the bad bacteria along with the good. That didn't sound great, but neither did having a lifelong infection. I was primed to take my doctor's suggestion. I was the daughter of scientists, a medical doctor, my mother, a theoretical physicist, my father, and a molecular geneticist, my stepmother. I have a master's degree in science journalism, and I work in, as the digital science editor at Smithsonian Magazine, where I fancied myself fluent in things like cells, biology, and bodies. 
To a large extent, I trusted medicine. I certainly trusted Dr. Pico, who had always approached my vagina with a curt, business-like efficiency. I took my poison like a good patient, every night on my back, for 10 days. But one night, I made a mistake. Exhausted from weeks of itching, thinking about itching, and trying not to itch, I passed out early. When I woke up again, it was 3 a.m. I stumbled to the bathroom, half awake, and unscrewed my orange pill container. Then, without thinking, I swallowed my vagina poison. I sat down on the toilet, hard. I took out my phone and typed frantically into the Google search bar. The top result was a study titled, Fatal Ingestion of Boric Acid in an Adult. I ran back to the bathroom and shook my boyfriend awake, but the words wouldn't come. Until that moment, I hadn't told him about the medication I was taking. Logically, I knew that whatever was happening to me down there had nothing to do with my self-worth. But in the back of my head, I still felt dirty, contaminated, like there was a force field of shame around my nether regions. Even for me, even in 2018, it turned out, you just didn't talk about your burning bush. I think I swallowed something I shouldn't have, I said, my voice a child's whisper. He took one look at my phone and started putting on his shoes. It was time to go to the emergency room. On the hospital bed, under the fluorescent lights, I remember feeling profoundly alienated from my body. I pictured myself getting my stomach pumped, convulsed by shockwaves, taken over by a force greater than myself. Beneath that disconnect was something else. Betrayal. Outrage. This wasn't supposed to happen. I thought of myself as an educated, rational, science-minded person equipped with the tools to control my own life. Why didn't I know the inner workings of my own body? Why did my gynecologist or any of the other doctors I encountered, medical experts who had spent their lives studying and caring for bodies like mine, why, for God's sake, had my gynecologist recommended I shove rat poison up my vagina? It hit me. I knew almost nothing about how my vagina worked. That was the moment this book was born. I set out to write a book on the science of vaginas. It would be fun and jaunty and full of wonder, a Miss Grizzle-esque journey into the intimate depths of the human body. But I soon realized I had a problem. There is a vast knowledge gap when it comes to what we know about the female body. Most of our scientific understanding of this realm is built off the study of male bodies. It was only in 1993 that a federal mandate required researchers to include women and minorities in clinical research. As the Associate Director for Women's Health at the National Institutes of Health put it, we literally know less about every aspect of female biology compared to male biology. Until recently, medical research on women in this country was centered mainly on fertility. I was told by one endometriosis expert, nobody in Congress really cares about the uterus when it doesn't have a baby in it. Only in, the 24, only in 2014 did the NIH start a branch to look at the health of vulvas, vaginas, ovaries, and uteruses in their own right. That was virtually the first time they acknowledged that these organs are integral to women's health, whether or not they tend to get pregnant. As a result, there are parts of your own body less known than the bottom of the ocean or the surface of Mars. Most researchers I talked to blame this dearth of knowledge on the black box problem. The female body is considered more complex, more obscure, with most of its plumbing tucked up inside. We've needed high-tech imaging tools. Tools that have only come around in recent decades, they said. When I heard these answers, I couldn't help thinking of what science had done in the 21st century. Put a rover on Mars, made a three-parent baby, built an artificial uterus. And we couldn't figure out the composition of vaginal mucus. It wasn't just a lack of tools, I would learn. It was a lack of will. Going back to Darwin, scientists had considered vaginas and their accoutrements less interesting, less important, and less dynamic than penises. They either didn't care, or felt embarrassed, or insisted on thinking of women as only reproductive, not sexual. You can only see what you're looking for, I was told by a sperm biologist. If you're not expecting females to be important or to make a real contribution, you're just not going out and actively studying them. He and others acknowledged that this discrepancy at its heart was due to sexism within science and who was actually doing the science. For most of history, women, especially women of color, trans women, and women who are sexual minorities, have been excluded from the supposedly universal human endeavor. As I reported this book, it became clear to me that the two problems were inseparable. The marginalization of women's bodies from science is largely due to the marginalization of women from science. Science is done by scientists. They live in their own eras, in their own skin. They look at the world not only through microscopes and telescopes, but through their own limited human lens. And for most of human history, these scientists have been Western, white, and male. 
They were shaped by the attitudes and politics of their time, and the knowledge they produced reinforced and perpetuated those politics. Throughout history, that scientific knowledge has been used to silence some and privilege others, to decide which bodies were worthy and which were not. I hope this book can illuminate some of the blinders that limited what those early anatomists saw, to challenge the idea that what they produced was objective knowledge, to show that, we had, that beyond that horizon, there was more to see and know. When, they, when these men looked at women, they often peered through a lens of reproduction. Women were walking wounds, baby machines, sexual difference. Today, a new generation is thinking outside this box. They're looking at those organs most bound up in reproduction, the uterus, ovaries, vagina, and seeing them as part of a larger whole, as being dynamic, active, and resilient, as a window into more universal processes, like healing and regeneration. You can't imagine what you can't see, but you can't see what you can't imagine. The people and discoveries in this book are a testament to what we can see if we imagine differently. Thank you. And now give me great pleasure to introduce our friend and colleague, Dr. Edelgard Wolfert, who will be engaging in conversation with Rachel Gross. Elga Wolfert is a distinguished service professor in psychology here at New Albany. She served formerly for 11 years as the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. She's the recipient of numerous awards for excellence in teaching. She's taken a very active role at the university in advancing opportunities for women scientists. And she's a co-founder, together with Marlene Belfort, of WISH, Women in Science and Health. Please welcome Elga Wolfert. Should be on. It should be on. Very good. Okay. So, good evening, everybody. Mark, you should use the mic, bro. Yes. I'm not using it. Sorry. <laughs> good evening, everybody. And uh, once more, good evening, Rachel. We have a really had a chance <laughs> to talk. Great to meet you in person in the public eye here. <laughs> Absolutely. So, this was a very interesting introduction really set the stage for uh, what we are going to talk about here this evening. Uh, you basically hit the nail on the head by identifying uh, a major problem, and that is the enormous knowledge gap that exists when we are talking about uh, female sexuality and uh, the female sex organs, and so on and so forth. And I, I think this is absolutely astounding <laughs> that we live in the 21st century and we know so little uh, because the lack of knowledge, as you just explained, translates itself also in the lack of treatment for problems that exist. And so there are very serious consequences associated with it. And so I wonder if you, you have already addressed some of these things, but if you could talk a little bit more about what has led to this development, and one additional issue, and that is, why do we feel so uncomfortable talking about sexuality and our sexual organs and so on and so forth? Yeah, a million dollar questions. Um, like, moving back. Yeah, I mean, to your last point, as I was reading that, I was like, oh my god, this is the first time I've read about my own vaginal infection. And to other people, what would my mom think? Uh, fortunately, she thinks it's awesome, because she's a doctor who has become obsessed with vaginas along with me. Um, but yeah, those are, those are both good. Um, maybe I can address the second one first. Um, like, why are we so uncomfortable talking about these issues? Um, I did a lot of um, going back to big name scientists of history to see kind of the framework that they left us. So I did a lot of research into Darwin and Freud. Um, and uh, Darwin was kind of a prude, I found out. He, he wrote a thousand pages on barnacle penises, but when it came to looking at female animals and female genitals, he had almost no curiosity, which was 
very out of character for this incredibly curious, brilliant, synthetic man. Um, and he really painted females as passive, um, less interesting, less intelligent, um, and almost literally said they were less evolved than males in every species. Um, so in a way, this is reflecting like the really specific politics of his time. This was kind of when suffrage was just beginning, and he was sort of a reactionary against a lot of women's rights. He was very against contraception, for instance. Um, and so he was reflecting this idea of the Victorian woman who was supposed to be chaste and passive. Um, but what I found was that that particular theme ended up sticking for a really long time and is still kind of dominates, in, in this case, evolutionary biology. So the biologists I talk to who now try to look at, to, to say basically like, hmm, maybe we should look at female genitals, especially if we're looking at genital evolution. They still have trouble explaining why their work is important, getting funding, getting stuff published, um, and they're like often laughed at or told that they make people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it may have something to do with the fact when we are talking about male genitals, uh, everybody can see them. <laughs> when we are talking about female genitals, it's different. Much of it is internal. Could that have something to do with the fact that there isn't that there have not been so many studies? Not that it justifies, but is there yeah. a possibility? That's usually what scientists say first when I ask about this question. Is like it's much more difficult to do female studies. Like their stuff's all up there. Like we didn't have the right tools. And absolutely. Um, it is sometimes more difficult. For instance, um, I saw an amazing study where Drosophila fly sperm were made to be fluorescent and then put in a female body, and then you could see exactly what the sperm were doing inside, and I made a GIF out of it, or GIF, I don't really know. Um, and like there, there are really creative ways to get at this now, and it's true, it was harder in the past, but we actually know almost the least about the female external genitals. So that's the thing I don't get. We've always been really interested in the uterus because where babies are made. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as I was getting into, I think there's a lot of focus on fertility and infertility. Um, but you know, now we don't know about the vulva, which is just like the part you can see in Dutch, but it's crazy to me because that's very easy to study. Right, right. Yeah, so you're right, that cannot be the reason. No. Yeah, but I didn't think of that until just now, actually, that you mentioned it. Um, because that's like, I have these very basic questions for, for that chapter that I do with Darwin, which I was like, all right, it's a vagina chapter. What are we learning about vaginas? Well, I can at least find out how the vulva and vagina change with age, puberty, child, or uh, with birth and childbirth. Um, nobody had that information. Like, even gynecology textbooks would use something like, oh, after six weeks, the vagina bounces back to its normal state. But then when asked where they got that, they would say, oh, it's just something you know from clinical practice. It's just a guess. Um, and when I looked into the shape and size of the vagina, which is also actually not that difficult to find out. You can do molds. Um, the one woman who looked into it was a retired anatomy teacher. And she was also like laughed off campus. And she was made to feel like her work wasn't important. And they wouldn't publish it in newsletters on campus. So she gave up, basically. There is, of course, more to the so-called external female genitalia than uh, just talking about the vagina and the labia. Um, you know that I'm a psychologist, and of course I'm familiar with the, wor with the work of Sigmund Freud. And Sigmund Freud was uh, a scientist who, a medical doctor, who made a very important distinction that stayed with us for over a century, and that is the difference between a so-called clitoral and vaginal orgasm. Now, of course, the clitoral orgasm is the immature orgasm, because this is something that a woman could produce herself. So the uh, real orgasm has to be the vaginal orgasm. No? I mean, of course, that was uh, naturally what the claim was. No? And so I think this is a very interesting topic, and I wonder what you can tell us about that. And especially, I mean, I read your book, you have an absolutely fascinating chapter <laughs> that deals with the clitoris and the enormous structure that 
but I was honestly not aware of. And so I was aware. I hope you would enlighten us. <laughs> I would love to. Um, yeah, I have a lot of feelings about Freud, although it is <laughs> Me too, <laughs> me too. <laughs> but you probably know a lot more. You're a psychologist, you studied him, so I mean, I feel bad taking pot shots at him, but not, not that bad. Um, yeah, so as you're saying, um, Freud had this concept, and like I hate to even repeat it, I like would never use the word vaginal orgasm without quotes, um, because he basically invented and popularized this concept um, in into war France. And I think I made the point last talk that this was a big era of like pronatalism, where it was really important for women to replenish the lost generation of men from World War One, so they had to have a lot of babies, and there was a lot of emphasis put on penetrative sex that could lead to babies, ideally in a marriage. And so this idea came about that there were different types of orgasms and one was more important than the other. And if you didn't have it, you weren't a mature woman. And he gets me mad just thinking about it because there were just so many millions of women who were made to feel inadequate or like their bodies were broken because of this ridiculous idea by this guy who was trained as a doctor, but had zero training in that, and like did not draw on any sort of biological evidence, and even said at one point, like, I can't tell you about women, you'll have to like, go ask the poets, because I don't know much about them. Um, so, I think bringing this forward to today, because you might be like, why do we care? Um, besides the fact that women's magazines still sometimes echo this idea, I talked to a lot of uh, surgeons and doctors in this book. Um, some of them did, um, they did procedures on women who had had female genital cutting, and there was a restorative kind of procedure to bring parts of the clitoris back up. And so these surgeons knew a lot about this organ, and they worked with women who were very like vulnerable and having this intimate experience done. And they still used the terms clitoral and vaginal to describe these women to me. And that seemed to be such a disservice and just like if you can't get it right and you studied this for so long and you know this anatomy better than anyone, then what does that leave for the rest of us? Um, so that disturbed me. Um, and I just found that the Freudian ideas have really found their way into medicine, even though he was practicing um, like, not in that realm. So gynecology echoed a lot of his ideas about hysteria, for instance, mm -hmm. even today. Um, but there's also a different problem associated with that. Uh, and I, I, you probably know the data better than I, but a large number of women simply uh, have very great difficulty being orgasmic through regular intercourse when the clitoris is not stimulated. And yet, due to this differentiation that we make, as if there were two different forms of orgasm, a lot of women are made to feel bad when they cannot have an orgasm through regular intercourse when the clitoris is not being stimulated. You know? And so, I mean, that's really the concern that comes from that saga that Freud created. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah, yeah, there's been a lot of like very large studies that I cite in the book showing that most women do not have that experience. The only thing I would maybe change is I wouldn't say regular intercourse because there's so many types of sex and the type that... Uh, I made that missionary position. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I do rag on the missionary position a lot in this book. I didn't realize, but apparently I have a vendetta against it. Um, but yeah, this idea that like missionary will get it done for everyone um, is like wildly untrue according to the data and yet it's what we're fed. So maybe that's a good segue into the clitoris because like, like what are these types of words? <laughs> um, yeah, so basically I, I talked to the first female urologist in Australia who is kind of credited as being the first to map the clitoris. Um, and her name is Helen O'Connell, and she, she did not like discover the shape. I think that gets a little simplified often in the media. Um, there were a lot of anatomists throughout history who 
did this work and knew that this was like a really expensive organ and not a button or a nub, as it's sometimes called. But their work was just never really followed up on and never really made it into the mainstream. Um, and there's a crazy history about like Greeks like claiming that the clitoris didn't exist or only existed in hermaphrodites, and then like in the early like Asian modern anatomy, you have literally an anatomist whose name was Columbo claiming that he had discovered the clitoris, and everyone who said that it was them was lying. So there were like cat fights about who had discovered the clitoris. Meanwhile, all women are just like. <laughs> Um, so, so Hello Powell did not discover the clitoris, but she knew about this history, and so she wanted to make a concerted effort to map it with modern tools, which she would like microdissection, MRI imaging, um, and she, so she was in a very male-dominated field um, that dealt with patients of all genders, and she noticed that when you got like a prostate surgery, like doctors will ask about your erections and they'll pay close attention to the nerves that innervate the penis. But with women, there are actually surgeries that affect that area too. So like pelvic mesh, urethra surgeries, anything around the vulva. Um, and nobody knew what those nerves were doing or where they were because nobody had done the work of mapping it. So like this incredibly sensitive and important part of female sexuality was just kind of left vulnerable. Um, so she did the studies and made this like insane splash in the media um, where she basically said what you think of the clitoris, the part that you can see and touch and feel, is actually just the tip of the iceberg. It's less than 10% of this organ. So the actual shape is this kind of, I call it like a penguin spaceship, but it has these arms that reach back um, against the pubic bones and these bulbs that kind of hug the clitoris. Uh, sorry, excuse me, hug the vagina. Um, and I have one for you, but my my cat got to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, many puns there. Here, we'll try to keep it intact. So um, I 3D printed a clitoris model at MIT, uh, which I use for show and tell all the time. Um, but basically, like holding it delicately, the beak, as you might think of it, um, that's like the shaft, and the tip of it is like the glands of the penis. So that's the part that you can see and touch. It's just the glands. And just like the penis, you have all these bodies of erectile tissue um, that are much larger and that swell with blood and become even larger and grow during arousal. Um, so these, I, like Helen O'Connell's kind of big concept was she called it the clitoral complex. And she wanted people to know that this organ interacts intimately with all the parts of the female pelvis. So there's this trend throughout history that I kept seeing where people really want to fragment the female body and say like, no, there's a vaginal orgasm and a clitoral orgasm. And even with the clitoris, they said, oh, these bulbs, we're going to call them the bulbs of the vestibule, like a waiting lobby, but the rest of it we can call the clitoris. And her point was like, it's all really connected in like nerves and blood supply um, and in sensation and in your experience. So it's not only not helpful, but it's like actively harmful to say like there are these types of experience and one is better than the other and it just doesn't line up with anatomy. I mean she obviously is an expert in that area like nobody else and I'm really curious now, did she identify the G spot? <laughs> you set me up for that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, she got a lot of questions about the G-spot after she published these early papers, and I don't know about everyone else's um, introduction to this. Um, it depends what generation we're from, I think. I was bombarded by like women's magazines saying, like, find your G-spot, it's a magic button, and like you should find yours. And I found that very alienating, and I was also like, who fact-checked this? Like, this sounds like men came up with it. Um, but I know another generation had a different experience where it was like, like that wasn't the original idea. It was like, um, well, I'll get into what it was. So the G-spot is named after a man, like many parts of the female body. Um, his name is Ernst Grafenberg. He was a German gynecologist who left when the Nazis came to power, and he invented the first IUD, and he also said that there's a spot 
Um, it's on the belly side of the vagina, a couple inches up, and it seems to be great for women and sometimes produce bloated. And later on, um, during like the second wave feminist movement, a sexologist named Beverly Whipple um, decided to make it a thing. And what I was surprised by and had no idea was she was trying to validate the experiences of women who had no like name or language for their experience. And she was like going off the data she had, but it ended up that the media kind of took this out of proportion and said it's like had the magic button idea. And that became what I eventually learned as a young girl um, reading women's magazines. Um, so, so that's what we had. And then, um, then Helen O'Connell was asked to figure out what the G-spot was anatomically as a scientist. Um, and she, again, did all the dissections and she found, oh, surprise, it's just the clitoris. So it's, um, it's the root of the clitoris. Um, it's, it seems to be based on her dissections, um, which faces this way. And basically it's where the arms and the bulbs wrap around the urethra and the vagina. And that kind of corresponds to the spot people have been calling the G-spot unhelpfully. Um, and because there's a lot of sensitive tissue there, it can feel differently. It can have more sensation for some people, but there's like a crazy range of anatomical variation that never gets talked about. So this is by no means like a universal experience. And it was not like a special mythical, like treasure chest at the end of a rainbow thing. So she really emphasized like, it's just the clitoris. Um, should be called the G spot, uh, and and I guess the connection that we made when we, we were talking, me and her, was it was sort of like the vaginal orgasm. It was like there's a sexual experience that you're supposed to have, and if you don't have it, then you should feel bad about yourself. And even though that wasn't the intention of the G spot idea, for a lot of people, it had become that. Um, and there were better ways of that looking at our bodies idea that there's something missing or you're missing out on something. Yeah, you're perfect the way you are, right. Freud. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all happy. We are agree. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to take out my Freudian uh, on you. I was trained as a behaviorist not to worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me switch gears for a moment. <clears throat> In your introduction, you shared your personal experience uh, with a, an infection that is incredibly common in women. And yet, again, in our time and age, we don't really have, uh, aside from antibiotics and rat poison, as I learned, we don't really have any warrior of treatments. <laughs> exactly. And so this is just absolutely surprising to me. Now, in your book, you talked about, uh, I think, some contemporary approaches uh, analogous to when we talk about fetal transplants. So would you please address that and talk a little bit about yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Glad no one's leaving the room. That makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So and this was one of the things that got me into the book was like thinking that I knew so much about female anatomy and biology. I was like, my mom's a doctor, I'm a science editor, I write about women in science, and then realizing that I had never heard of this infection and had no idea. It turns out a third of American women have it, um, and pretty much that much around the world. Um, and it's the most common, like, uh, general vulva vaginal condition, I believe. Um, so it, I think it, um, it hit the problem that you get when you cover these kind of topics sometimes, which is like, that doesn't sound like a big deal. That's just a lady parts thing. That just sounds kind of uncomfortable. And like, for me, yes, it was just like a frustrating month and then I was fine. But this actually, like I talked to a lot of women who had it and who had undergone some of these new treatments. And it's recurrent. Yeah. Or especially when it's recurrent. Um, it really ruins people's lives, it ruins their most intimate relationships, they really discuss this deep feeling of shame and how it really got to the core of their identity. And if that's not enough, 
then you go to the medical side and like it, it increases your risks of getting sexually transmitted infections and it unfortunately increases your risk um, of preterm birth if you're considering getting pregnant. So there are a lot of bad downstream effects. So it's both like it's both a big deal and it isn't a big deal. It depends on your situation. But it is something that medicine should be addressing when a third of women have it and like we all go to the gynecologist and like you would expect there to be a solution, but no. Um, so what I found was that it's really, really new that we are even looking at the vaginal microbiome. And basically we all have, I call it like a planet down there, but it's like its own ecosystem. And there are a ton of different types of bacteria, uh, one in good bacteria, um, but one in particular that creates a mild acid, lactic acid, so the same that makes yogurt and cheese and keeps the vagina a little acidic, like a glass of red wine, which is my favorite fact. Um, and that's really helpful at protecting it from infections and invaders. And basically, BV um, and other types of infections are kind of like an ecosystem shift, where like you have a garden, it's okay to have some weeds, but if you have the wrong balance, too many weeds, then that's when you're more vulnerable to infections. Um, so these new scientists that you were mentioning they came up with the idea of a vaginal transplant, which is basically moving one woman's ecosystem to another, a woman that is, you know, has the most optimum level for the most types of women, because there are like many, many differences. Um, and so they're working on that now, and it's really slow going, but I think that's good, um, because like there's a lot of, there's a dark history to vaginal microbiome transplants, and there's a lot of ethical issues, um, and there's the fear of transmitting things. Yeah, so they've, and so throughout the pandemic, they've been like interviewing women and like um, finding the best people and like slowly doing like a small pilot study. Um, but this is an idea that is taking hold is vaginal probiotics and vaginal transplants, the idea that you can terraform your vagina. It's fascinating. I mean, this is really still. Uh, we are at the beginning as far as that is concerned. No? Now, there is another um, disease uh, that is relatively common, not like these bacterial infections. And I'm talking about endometriosis, which is, of course, a completely debilitating disease for women who have it. And it seems that, again, this is a problem where we don't, we don't understand the origin we don't really have a treatment. It is my understanding that uh, when you are a young woman, you go to your gynecologist and endometriosis is the problem. They say get pregnant because sometimes with the pregnancy it goes away. And if it is a woman who maybe has had children, well then the cure, quote unquote, and that is horrific for me, would be then basically removing the uterus and the ovaries, and hysterectomy, so to speak, with all of the horrible consequences that it can have. You know? So what do you know uh, about endometriosis, and where are we in terms of treating this disease? Yeah, um, I would say it is bad, but it's not quite that bad anymore. I think in the 80s, that was um, really big, the like suggestion that maybe should get pregnant. Um, and there's still endometriosis is, I think, the number one reason that's not life-threatening for um, hysterectomies, um, which is crazy. So this is um, a condition where tissue that's very similar to the lining of the uterus grows outside it, and it can grow on the ovaries, but it can also make its way through the body and grow on even the lungs or the brain. So you can imagine that would be incredibly painful. Um, and what's like awful for people who have it, but also remarkable, is that the lining of the uterus is a completely unique tissue. It's pretty much the only tissue in the body that regrows itself every month in response to like these symphony of hormones, and then like decides to shed itself, which is a period, and regrows itself again. Um, so it's this really dynamic tissue that scientists really haven't looked much at um, until some, including one in this book, um, a bioengineer at MIT, 
said, hey, like, I bioengineer things like ears on mice, and we look at, like, regenerative tissue, like, bone, but this is actually the most regenerative tissue that has a lot to teach us about just this basic biological process, regeneration, immunity, because there's all these immune cells that are involved in menstruation, um, and, like, stem cells, because stem cells are part of this. And so she kind of used that argument to say it's not just about women's disease and women's pain, though we should care about that, um, but also all you engineers and all you funding bodies should really be interested in these like biological secrets that we could unlock. Um, so that's one way that she got um, support, and she's growing uterine organoids, so like mini uterine linings in a um, hormone environment in the lab, and that's so you can test new treatments on them, and you can see what the environment that leads to something like endometriosis is. So if you have like an inflammatory environment from birth, um, inflammation is thought to be a really big um, factor in it. Then you can see like which uterine lining develops in like a more disease way or an endometriosis way um, without obviously harming any humans. Um, and so you can look at it in a dish. So that's um, that's kind of one of the like pilot projects going on. Um, another one I looked into is the ideas you want to know earlier because a lot of women when, when they find out because they've been like dismissed for so long and doctors have told them that they should use an antidepressant or talk to a therapist. So then 10 years later, this is spread throughout their body and it has really bad effects. Um, so I also talked to a group of scientists that are trying to use menstrual blood as a natural biopsy mm -hmm. or like um, a window into the uterus basically to say, are there markers of something like endometriosis or infertility or other conditions? Um, and their idea is like, we have this every month, like why don't we just use it as a painless, like non-intrusive way? Um, but they found that when they were asking gynecologists to get like data, um, they were like, can you ask your patients to use this sponge or this kind of tampon thing? And the gynecologists were all like, oh no, I can't ask my patient that. Oh, that's weird. But then when they asked them directly, all the women were like, yeah, this could help anyone who has this, I would love to. So, science. It's really, it's really scary. As a psychologist, I can't relate to that because it has happened. I also have a private practice, and it has happened to me that I occasionally get patients referred by doctors who believe that they have some kind of a mental issue when I am not at all convinced that I believe there's an underlying physical issue. And it just seems that sometimes when uh, physicians are not aware or don't know exactly what it is, and they can't find a reason, but then it has to be psychological, you know? And that can be very, very dangerous. Yeah, exactly. And what I learned that I didn't realize is endometriosis is a big one, but there's so many chronic illnesses that fall into that category. And weirdly, a lot of them are considered like female illnesses, and they happen to be a lot of immune disorders, like um, POTS or Crohn's or chronic fatigue syndrome. And so these are kind of the orphan diseases that have not gotten much funding, which means people haven't found many biomarkers, which means they can say they're not real diseases, exactly. which is a horrible, it's a vicious cycle. Well, Rachel, I still have a ton of questions, but time flies, and so I think I would like to turn it over to the audience and see if there is, uh, I hope there are some people in the audience who have questions, and so please go ahead. So, as COS, I have first-hand experience with gynecologists offering birth control as the only option to treat. Um, are there any avenues of your research that you've discovered that people are studying alternatives to birth control to treat these issues? Um, first of all, I'm sorry <laughs> on behalf of medicine. Um, it's hard because I'm, you know, I'm not a doctor or scientist, as you know. Um, and I don't know too much about PCOS, but um, I know for endometriosis, they've come out with a few new um, medicines, including one called Orlissa, and it has, it's supposed to have less side effects, but it's still the same mechanism, so it's still a hormonal suppression, because, yeah, I don't know if I explained it, you, you already know this, but um, 
that that dynamic tissue lining responds to hormones. So when you get a hormone surge, um, that's when it grows and then sheds, and you don't want that happening in somewhere not your uterus. So that's why hormonal birth control and um, those kind of things are thought to tamp it down because they lower the hormones. Um, the the only thing relevant I think is I talk to researchers who are saying like we think this is about systemic inflammation we don't think it's just about hormones and so maybe there are anti-inflammatory drugs that could be tried in the future early on in these kind of disorders um, like like arthritis drugs and no one's tested that so it was just a hypothesis um, I mean I, I do think like that there's a lot more awareness and attention and funding today than there was five years ago. So, like, I talked to, like, the Women's Health branch of the NIH, and they're like, we really care about this, and we're trying to have, like, centers of research for it. So I think there's stuff in the pipeline. But I would like to look more into that. I'm sorry I don't have more. Thank you. Anybody else? Other questions? Comments? Please, go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, understanding uh, widespread religious practices, maybe in North Africa and other places. You know, hold on a second. I'm so so Let me give you my microphone so that yes, anybody else I can. <laughs> yes, religious practices, maybe uh, in Islamic cultures where they take a scalpel to the woman's foot. And this is widespread, and it seemed to me, why are they doing this? But there seems to be some underlying religious purpose involved here. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I understand what you're interested in. Um, I think I like cringe a little bit, because I think these are really complicated and transcultural practices that aren't all underlined by religion or one religion by any means. Um, so one thing I, I did in the book um, was I looked at a lot of, like there is this idea that certain cultures practice genital cutting. Um, I looked in that the, the time of Freud and actually clitoridectomy was very common in England and America. So, really, it was popularized in Britain um, and other places too, I'm sure, but there was a surgeon called Isaac Baker Brown, and he said, this is the best way to prevent kids from masturbating. We should cut it off. And eventually, the other surgeons were like, we don't think this is a good idea. Let's do it less. Um, and then it caught on in America, and actually, one of his big supporters was um, John Harvey Kellogg of Kellogg Cornflakes, who was a doctor. And he also was very, very adamantly against masturbation. And he recommended that and uh, clitoral amputation and putting acid on it. Um, and boys too, um, to be clear. But so I think when we talk about these practices, it's really important to realize that um, they have a long history, a long history in Western cultures, um, and a history that does transcend any one culture or religion. Um, and they obviously have many purposes, like any cultural practice. Um, uh, this probably would open a whole can of worms, but a lot of people talk to me about male circumcision um, and how it's very, very naturalized in certain countries, but there are parallels. It's not at all the same practice with completely different consequences, but shouldn't we be asking about general cutting across genders and bodies, and why it's okay for anyone. So yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions, comments? Kira, please. Thank you. I am so excited about reading this book, so thank you. Um, Kira, a uh, question about fibroids. If, you know, there's this, um, 
and maybe it's a two-faceted thing because you know when you bring up fibroids and it's company men don't know what we're talking about. Um, we can divide. <laughs> um, and it's said that I've seen in some research. It said that well, in the black community, we say it's very prominent. But it's, is it limited, or what, what do you know about fibroids across the generation? Yeah. So. So fibroids are like a really common condition, right? It's like a growth usually on the ovaries and um, like a lot of people I know have them, but weirdly like I didn't learn about them until I got in my 30s and nobody talked about them and like I didn't really know what they were. Um, and yeah, so my understanding is it is like more common in the black community in certain communities. And the way I think of it is like it's kind of the next step for what endometriosis just went through. So endometriosis like kind of just gained a lot of awareness and chances are many people in this room knew the word before I said it, whereas five years ago that wouldn't be the case. Um, and it has gained some, like not enough, but some funding and this realization that it's a serious problem. Um, I think not coincidentally it was thought it was a white woman's disease as a disease of neurotic career women, and that was literally written in textbooks. And I think the fact that fibroids can be more severe or affect more women of color has meant that they are even less researched and more marginalized and in need of more attention. Um, I don't... Have you, have you heard anything about it being related to a deficiency in vitamin D? No, I can't say I know anything about that, unfortunately. I think you had your hand up. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, so I know I've been talking a little bit about like lack of knowledge and why that plays a huge role in it, and why it's so uncomfortable to talk about these. But I also have found that um, when I immigrated to America, the early childhood education seems to me to be one of the most important factors in kind of learning about our vaginas. And I think that a lot of shame started for me, at least. I can't speak for everyone with a vagina, obviously, but. Um, at a very young age, and it was um, not talked about in classrooms. Um, I often saw like, diagrams of a penis, but never a vagina. There was also only ever um, discussions on penetrative sex as well. So I was wondering if you could, like, if you can talk a little bit about like how important, if it is, childhood, um, early childhood education is in all this. Rephrase the question. Oh yeah, the audience revolves. I forgot to get the microphone. So yeah. No, no, you're perfect. I could hear you very well. Um, I, I think um, she was saying that uh, many of your early experiences when you immigrated to America um, about like hearing about the vagina were in early childhood, and it was about not hearing about the vagina. Um, and it sounds like the information you got was pretty skewed towards penetrative sex. Um, sounds about right for America. Um, or are you talking about sex education? Because yeah, sex education as well, but um, also even with parenting. Like mm -hmm. I found that that's also like a huge factor. Is like yeah. as a parent talking to your child with vagina about their vagina as well. That's yeah. All aspects, that makes sense. Yeah, um, I do have thoughts on this. Um, my. I, I also can't speak for everyone, but from what I've seen of how sex education gets taught in this country and from my experience, um, for women and people with vaginas, it's very much about how to not get an STD and how to not get pregnant. Um, and with boys, we often have a much larger spectrum. We talk about like pleasure and wet dreams and, you know, like, yeah, the same equipment is involved, so I get it. But um, I think it's incredibly skewed that we barely talk about pleasure, orgasm, and masturbation for girls and go straight to the like, here's the threat, here's what you avoid, be a good girl, be kind of ashamed of this, this mysterious thing called your period is going to hit at some point, it's going to be bloody, and it's going to be bad. Um, so I, I think it's really biased and like I don't have the data for that, um, but I would love to see more in early childhood about the really cool basic science that happens in the female body um, at puberty and beyond. Like every part of the female body is awesome, but the science of ovulation and menstruation, 
like I was saying, is super unique, and it's not about like shedding and blood and loss. It's about regeneration, regrowth, resilience, and like the uterus literally like learning and improving itself every time. Um, and if I was getting was learning about body at a young age, I would much rather be introduced through a lens of wonder and excitement, and also that like it is fine and good to like feel pleasure from my body, which is mine, um, instead of being introduced to like protect yourself against these horrible things that can and will happen to you. And also, nobody understands how your period works, but here's a pad. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Please. Let me give you the microphone because I should have done that here. I forgot. I am interested in what you said about how the vagina is supposedly uh, just bounces back after childbirth at the six week mark. I was thinking about how things are different in France with the healthcare system and how women are taught how to um, repair or how to tone the pelvic floor mm -hmm. after childbirth and how that is just not a part of what happens here in America and what you learned about that and whether you think there is a movement to change things or what, how things could be done better to support women after childbirth. Yeah. I'm so glad you asked that. Um, I did some reporting in France and like I was learning about how different it is there and it was shocking. Um, Basically, if I could do this over again, I'd probably have a whole chapter on the pelvic floor, which is like not even the best term. It's like the kind of bowl of interlaced muscles that supports all of your pelvic organs, including reproductive organs. But it's super important, and it's what we refer to when we say Kegels, also named after a man. Um, so if you're tightening your Kegels, you're toning your pelvic floor. And it, it, because it supports like the vagina and uterus, it has a lot to do with how your your body like is resilient or bounces back um, and yeah I don't think people get that I haven't had a baby but I don't think people get as much information here or in the same way and the same support um, so I haven't seen in America as much um, of that movement yet I've seen it in like Australia um, but uh, yeah there is obviously there's a persistent fear about childbirth about what it does to your vagina and we actually don't have the data on that what we know is that like um it's an extremely dynamic process that literally moves your hip bones and moves all your organs around so of course things change but like the body's also very resilient and there are ways to to address that just like you were saying um so yeah i'm personally much more interested in the pelvic floor muscles now and I think they're way more important than we give them credit for because we don't realize how interlaced they are with all these organs. Yeah. Thank you. So I am afraid, yes, that this was the last question, and I see Mark already approaching, so I don't, I, I will leave the last word to you then, Mark. Okay. Oh, I, I, I was just going to say, big hand, please, for Rachel. <laughs>